Chewer Falls. The only characters you should ever level to 90 are animal units, transformers, reaction carries, additive reaction carries, buffers, and characters that don't scale on attack. Did you say true? If so, stay tuned because this video may just blow your mind. This is a Sucrose National Team. We all know it. We all have varying opinions of it. However, it is undeniable since the launch of Genshin three years ago, this team has reigned as one of the absolute top meta teams in the game. Now, let me ask you a question. If you had all these characters at level 80 of 90, in what order would you prioritize taking the characters in the team to 90 to boost the overall damage of this team? Have your answer? Let me take a guess. You probably said Sucrose first because she's Anima, then Bennett to increase his attack buff, and Qingqiu and Xiangling are the lowest in that priority because they're attack scaling characters. Well, about that. It's actually the opposite. Allow me to demonstrate. <laughs> this is GC Sim. We can use it to get a lot of useful data for how to best optimize our team comps, rotations, artifacts, weapons, you name it. I pulled up a sim for a Sucrose National team. Full disclaimer, I did not make this sim. Sucrose National is a very technical team that requires very optimized rotations to be simmed, and I do better work when working with smooth brain rotations that move logically from one thing to the next in a circle until the virtual enemy no longer exists. What I can say is that this sim is definitely an accurate portrayal of the team's performance down to the aura of time and which abilities are doing which reactions. Link will be in the description if you'd like to check for yourselves. As you can see, I've gone in and reset all characters to level 80 of 90 to see how leveling a character to 90 will impact the team's performance. All we have to do is come over here to the config and change that 80 of 90 back to 90 of 90. Let's just go down the line of what was guessed earlier, starting with Sucrose. Then we take the previous number divided by the new number and subtract the result from one Take the resulting decimal and move it two spaces to the right and that is the percent increase to our total damage we got from taking her to 90. Then we go back, change Sucros back to 80, put Benny at 90, and repeat this process until we've done it for all characters. The results speak for themselves. It's not even close. The true order of priority for the team is Xiangling, Xingzhou, Bennett, and then Sucros. Now, if that's absolutely shattering your reality, it's okay, breathe. Zolda Pop is here to explain why. It's all about context. If we look at this chart right here, we can see how much each character is contributing to the team's total DPS. If we hover over it, we can see exactly how much DPS they're contributing. For characters that are primarily used to buff other characters, we can just compare the changes to that character and the characters being buffed. Looking at the DPS contributions, we can see that Sucrose's contribution is almost non-existent. But if we compare her 80 to 90 numbers, that's a pretty substantial increase to her own damage. The problem is, her contribution is so low that even if we doubled it, doubling something that's next to nothing just makes it next to next to nothing at best. Zero times two is still zero, after all. She doesn't get any more EM from going to 90, so she's not buffing the team any more than she already was. So it's only natural that in this particular team, 90 isn't going to do a lot for her. How about Bennett? Shouldn't leveling him to 90 substantially increase Xiangling's damage? No, not at all. You see, there's something you gotta know about Bennett. His attack buff is a flat attack buff based on his base attack which is his base and his weapon's base attack. From 80 to 90, that only increases by 14. That's less than a single average flat attack roll on an artifact. I can imagine if you were rolling a new artifact hoping for an upgrade and all you got out of it was a single low flat attack roll, you'd rightfully be pretty disappointed by those results. At talent level 13, the buff is only 0.125 more flat attack than the average flat attack roll. Not 0.125%, just 0.125.
even when it comes down to the characters that are actually contributing a noticeable increase to our team's damage, you might be surprised to know, if you didn't watch my additive reaction video, the extra base attack has very little to do with their increase. What really matters for them is enemy defense. A basic explanation for how enemy defense works in Genshin is that it's calculated based on your characters and the enemy's level. That formula creates a percent value, then multiplies your damage by that percent. When your character and the enemy are the same level, that value is 50%. Meaning if your true damage, assuming zero resistance, is 10,000, you'll only be doing 50% of that, or 5,000 after damage is calculated. Unless they're doing transformative reactions, in that case the reactions don't care about the defense. The further you are away from their level, the lower that percent value is. Thus, the lower your damage. The further above their level, the higher the percent value. Thus, the higher your damage. It's not linear either. The disparity grows the further out you get before leveling out. Here's what that looks like. The thing is, there's really only two ways you'll ever even notice it. If you set domains or weekly bosses to lower levels, and two, in floor 12 of the Spiral Abyss. Looking back at our graph, we can get some perspective on how the enemy defense multiplier compares with different levels. The difference between level 80 characters and level 100 enemies is roughly equivalent to that of level 70 characters and level 90 enemies. So it's not much of an exaggeration to say that using level 80 attack scaling characters in floor 12 chamber 3 of Abyss will perform pretty similarly to level 70 characters at world level 8 in overworld. Ah, but there's the key word, attack scaling characters. Obviously, the characters you should prioritize are non-attack scaling characters. Well, about that. Remember what I said about context? Another full disclaimer, what I'm about to tell you was a bit of a surprise to me too. I had totally bought into the idea that non-attack scaling characters get a pretty sizable bump from going to 80 to 90, but as I looked to the data, what I found was that is correlative, not causal. Let's take a look at those characters with non-attack scaling. That would be characters like Ito, Noel, Hu Tao, and Yilan. There's something all of these characters have in common. Can you guess what it is? Think back to the beginning of the video. Why did Shangling and Qingzhou get more out of being taken to 90. That's right, because they make up a larger portion of the team's damage. The reason all but one of these characters benefit more than other characters from being taken to 90 isn't because they have non-attack scaling attributes. It just so happens that characters with non-attack scaling attributes tend to have more of a role as hyper carries. We can take Ito, for instance, and compare him to someone like Xiao, Wanderer, or Double Pyro, Double Geo, Yoimiya, and what we see is that the DPS contribution is roughly equal. As it turns out, the game is actually balanced pretty well. His and Noel's defense scalings and Hu Tao's HP scaling are ultimately converted to attack, so of course, in the end, it'll be balanced in the same direction as purely attack scaling characters. It's the modifiers being added to it after that pushes them into a league of their own. The base stat increase from 80 to 90 isn't noticeably different to the damage calculation from the base stat increase other characters get from attack. Now, there is an elephant in the room I haven't addressed yet. All of these increases seem kind of low, so is it actually not worth leveling them to 90? Again, context. If we, for instance, look at Ito again, we can see he's getting thousands of extra damage every second from the boost. Depending on your team and level of investment, that boost could be the difference between clearing and not clearing. To give some additional perspective, we can take a look at their level 90 damage, set them to 80, and then increase their substats in the config to simulate how much investment into artifacts it would take to match the increase they got from level 90. If we take a look at Ito again, we can see it'd take four rolls of crit to meet that increase. The question you've got to ask is, 
which will be a better use of my resin to get that increase. A week of farming ley lines or months of artifact farming? Check out this video to see how insane resin costs are for upgrades at certain levels of investment. Even crowning him doesn't match the increase he gets from it. And that costs more than level 90 in Mora, and significantly more in resin, plus a crown you'll never see again. So if you're willing to crown a character, why are you leaving them at 80? It's a bigger increase to le level them to 90 than give them a crown. So with all that said, how can you know if you should take a character to 90? Using what we've discussed in this video and my previous videos, I've developed a handy dandy flowchart just for you. People still like flowcharts, right? What do you mean? That was just a 2020 thing when people were cooped up inside. It's not like they became less useful. Don't call me a boomer, that hurts! Anyway, here we go. Do you want to play the character? Do you play them often? Do they make up a large portion of your team's damage? Do you want them to do more damage? Do they deal that damage through transformative reactions? If yes, 90. Are they an animal unit that doesn't do a lot of transformative reactions, but does offer a lot of CC? Level 90, CC is like defense. It scales based off character level compared to enemies levels. Do they deal that damage through additive reactions? If yes, 90. Do they already have an artifact set and weapon that meets their ER requirements, a balanced ratio, and a reasonable amount of the primary stat their damage scales off of, and EM if they rely on amplifying reactions. Have you been farming for artifact upgrades despite this? Are their talents leveled? Do you have other characters you want to invest into? If yes, 80. Is their name Yelan? Do you want to use them regularly in Abyss 12? If after going through all of that, you never found yourself at day at 80, there's really no reason not to. It doesn't take as many resources as you might think. Using the stay at 80 is a guaranteed damage loss and the vast majority of your resin you spend on artifacts when they already have a functional set ends up wasted. Which domains are resin efficient gets talked about a lot, but if you think about it, can you really call any use of your resin that doesn't increase your character's power or invest into other characters resin efficient? Is that it? No. There's one other major misconception that's from the level 90 slander that I've discovered from reviewing accounts that no one seems to have realized, and that's weapons. Theory crafters and content creators seem to take for granted what players do and don't know, due to the fact that they do the majority of their work, assuming everyone is taking their characters and weapons to max level. And that's that a lot of players have seen level 90 as a trap, and assume that applies to weapons too, despite never being told that. I'd wager there are even people watching this video right now that don't know that, unlike character's ascension stats, secondary stats on weapons do continue to increase after level 80, and it's often more than you'd get from an extra roll of that stat and artifacts. Sometimes double. And that's a totally understandable assumption. It's a weird design choice on Hoya's part to have them function differently with levels. Weapon enhancement crystals are pretty much infinitely farmable, and the more it costs is so much less than leveling talent or character levels. Put into perspective, it only costs 100,000 more Mora than that artifact you just threw away after maxing it out trying to get an extra crit roll or two and it going in the flat def instead. Taking a max ascended weapon from 80 to 90 is literally the most resin efficient thing you can do in the game to increase a character's strength because you don't even have to spend resin to do it. It's actually baffling Hoyo didn't resin gate weapon crystals. It's an absolute oddity in the resin economy. If you've got a weapon you use a lot, especially if you swap it between multiple characters, 100% of the time you should be taking it to 90. No question. So yeah, there you go. It took me half a year, but that's it. The full truth about level 90. If you learned something or enjoyed the time you spent here, it'd really help me out if you consider dropping a like. There's another video about to pop up on screen that YouTube thinks you might enjoy. Feel free to give it a watch. 
for the lore people that made it this far i've got a wacky one in the pipeline for you so look forward to that and also sorry about the mic i'm not at home soundproofing in here is kind of weird but yeah that's it bye